three-dimensional being. So let's go to a different level. And from that level, you can see more of the map of your own life. And you can say, okay, there is, there is an autumn, there is a fall, but there is also a winter, which looks even weirder. But then there's a spring and then there's a summer, and that cycle repeats. And what these calendar systems do is map that at the local level and at the macro level, if you like. And so there are little synchronal, uh, synchronous shifts that occur very closely related with consciousness. And there are little ones, and there are medium-sized ones, and there are big ones. And it seems to me that we, we're on the edge of a big one at the moment which is what I think of in my own um, philosophy, if you like, as a seasonal change. Now, my uh, view on this is that we, the seasonal change that we're going to experience is going from winter into spring, if you want to use that metaphor. Mm -hmm. And we've lived in winter for so long that even though spring seems like quite a nice prospect to the rational mind, it's still scary because everything that we'd associated with that previous season and all the systems that we've built up to deal with it and um, engineer it and manufacture it and perpetuate it, all those things will be obsolete. They won't ever be needed again. So for those people who have completely and totally lost themselves in the narrative of winter time, they're going to struggle because that's going away now something completely different is coming in. And as a spiritual person, one has a little bit of an advantage over those people, not a big one, just a little one, in that psychologically we, we're more prepared for that. So we'll still feel the same discomfort from time to time and still occasionally feel that uncertainty as a bit of a grip in your chest or your stomach. And yet psychologically, because of the work we've been doing and the study in our spiritual path, we're more flexible. We're not as invested in the third density state and in the winter time. Mm -hmm. And so part of us, in fact, is quite excited to move away from that. But as long as we're doing that um, with the right virtue, to use that rather old-fashioned word, uh, then that's okay, because me too, I'm, you know, I'll be very happy to wave goodbye to uh, conscious winter time and jump into the spring, you know, it'll be a wonderful thing to see those first new shoots and flowers opening up. How, how wonderful to see the green return after all the grayness and darkness. But that's because I've done decades of hard work on myself mm -hmm. to decondition myself, to purify my consciousness, to lower my egoic mind, to increase my humble attitude in life. And all those things that we understand about spirituality. Um, and, and if you haven't done that, the prospect of a seasonal change is just very, very odd and very scary. And it's really just a macro version of the seasonal change that happens in somebody's personal life when they begin their awakening. So to get right back to your sort of original question, people don't want to wake up because they're they're afraid of the unknown, and people are um, very cautious about end dates and apocalypses, which is just, uh, I'm sure many people have figured out when you look at the etymology of these words, although it can tell you what the word means, of course, and where it came from and its history, it also can give you a clue about the truth of a phrase. So an apocalypse really is just the lifting of the veil at the end of the age, and that seems to me to be rather a wonderful thing. So mm -hmm. if somebody ever is like, do you think the apocalypse is, is, the apocalypse is coming? I'm like, well, I sure hope so. I really hope it is, you know. Whatever word you want to, however you want to describe it. Yeah. Well, I love your analogy of the seasons because, of course, doing astrology and numerology, everything is cyclical. So, you know, my mind works like that in this giant spiral. So I completely connecting uh, with what you're saying. And I would also like your perspective on, I mean, I gravitate towards uh, the feeling that there's seven dimensions. You know, other people think there's 12 and 13 and goodness knows how many. But regardless of how many people perceive there are, what 
is your um, outlook or your sense of what the dimensions look like and what a dimensional shift actually would look like. <laughs> we need about five hours for that, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> uh, let, me, let, me and, let me try and disconnect. You've got 20 five. minutes. <laughs> oh, I've got 20 minutes. Oh, wow, there we are then. <laughs> easy, easy, absolutely easy, yeah. 20 minutes for such a fast question. Um, well, you know, again, we have to, we can stick a, a flag in the ground and say there's three or there's four or there's seven or there's 25 or there's 102. And you can build a quite a nice argument for any number that you can think of, really, as to mm. how many there are. And scientists like to say there's 10 or 11 or 26, usually, based on current ideas of string and superstring theory and whatnot. And although that seems very credible to a lot of people because it's scientists doing it, it's just as laughable as some of the uh, more crackpot mystics that used to have a go at this stuff. Mm -hmm. So the point is you have to go to credible mystics and credible scientists, in my view. And just like everywhere else in life, that means you have to hunt, sift through a lot of nonsense to get there. And so my view is to go to... Um, the earliest sources we've got in some way. Not that early means true, because just because it's written in a cuneiform in a stone tablet doesn't mean anything. It mm -hmm. could still be absolute nonsense, just like it's written in the Washington Post today. You know, it doesn't mean that it's anything special. The advantage of going to the old stuff, though, is you can track its evolution and see how uh, kind of pure it is, in a way. Because as something goes through the eons, through the millennia, true stuff tends to stay kind of the same in a way. It transforms its appearance a little bit and it becomes a little more refined, shall we say. But the core of it stays the same. And I have found that, I mean, Buddhism really is, is as Alan Watts used to say, is Hinduism stripped down for export. <laughs> so you can, you, can understand, you can understand the principles of Hinduism by studying for a few years inside out back to front Buddhism. But inevitably, the keen Buddhist student will be drawn back to the roots of that, which is Hinduism. And so looking at the way they describe things in terms of heavens, planes, and spheres and stuff, you can look at how that's described by them. And I think that's important to do. we are not got time to go into it here, but that's, that's a useful way of looking at it. Um, my understanding has been shaped to some extent by European um, esoteric schools, um, all different kinds of systems of occultism and magic and, um, you know, Victorian mysticism and medieval mysticism. And that, that to me, is a, a very beautiful uh, way of organizing information about the earth and understanding what, what we can see before us. And then in a little later started looking at the popular end of quantum physics because quite frankly that's the only part I can understand as soon as it's real quantum physics my eyes just glaze over really because I've not been trained to mm -hmm. you know, engage with the information at that level but fortunately I've known um, just a short time ago I uh, very, became very friendly with a physicist and so I always just like get the um, <laughs> you know the potted history and the the bullet points, the cliff notes or whatever from him. That's been very useful. Um, but I would say, to, to give you a sort of, a sort of fair answer, um, I, I say there are seven densities, okay? Um, when I say density, what I'm meaning by that is um, a level of energy that is organized in, in a particular kind of way. And if you say density to a scientist, they're going to kind of get... Um, all worked up because they think that it's they know what density is, yeah, because they mm -hmm. deal with it as classically as mass per volume. But there are many types of density. There's like linear density, particle density, Planck density, charge density, tensor density, lots of different kinds. When I'm talking about density, I'm talking about it as an organizational layer of information, a density of vibration, we might say. And that, for me, nicely places the focus on consciousness rather than any sort of spatial dimension. 
So if you say dimension, again, people think,